everyone. We have a wonderful and engaging discussion planned for today with an amazing leadership panel. You can find their bios on the website. In addition, you will learn more about how the CETA initiative uh, has supported wonderful organizations to commit to virtual changes around the globe. Please note that at the end of this engaging panel discussion, this special panel will, will be open to answer additional questions. Again, it is my honor to introduce our amazing panelists who will contribute to this rich conversation this morning, or this afternoon, depending on where you are located now. Panelists, please introduce yourself and spend about 30 seconds giving a brief overview of your wonderful program. Welcome, Elizabeth Black. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that great introduction, Melissa. Um, I'm Elizabeth Black. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Virtual Exchange at Global Ties US and currently based in Washington, DC. Um, a little bit about Global Ties US. We are an organization that powers individuals, communities, and nations to build trust and advance peace and prosperity through international exchange. We are a nonprofit partner of the US Department of State and have a network of about 120 nonprofit organizations representing all 50 US states and more than 20 countries. And a little bit about the uh, specific program that is funded by Stevens that I'm here to talk about today. Um, it is the MERGE program, the MENA USA Empowering Resilient Girls Exchange, which brings together girls ages 15 to 19 from the US and MENA region in a supportive virtual space to learn about their mental health, develop emotional resilience skills, and share this knowledge with their communities. And with that, trying to keep to my 30 seconds, I will pass it back to Melissa. Thank you. Again, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Please welcome Travis Hardy. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm Travis, and I lead programs and partnerships at Empatico, which is a digital platform for classrooms to match and connect with other classrooms around the world through a combination of live video virtual exchanges and activities that reinforce key social emotional skills. Our mission is really to build a future more empathetic generation and we've done that by creating experiences for younger students at a time when they're curious about the world and open to exploring similarities and differences with others. Our program that we are talking about today is the Coding with Empathy Challenge, which is a pilot project for middle school classrooms in the US and Egypt um, to explore computer science concepts together. And I'll, I'm sure I'll be sharing more about that in a little bit. Thank you. We are so thrilled to have you here uh, today, Travis. Finally, we have Megan Lavery. Hi everyone, and I'll apologize up front for any connection issues that I'm having, but that seems to be the nature of things these days. Um, so I'm a program manager for Engineering World Health, and we are a nonprofit organization based out of Durham, North Carolina. We're focused on engaging young engineers, scientists, and health professionals to better address a lot of global health challenges. So this year we're running multiple virtual exchange programs that are engaging students from the US, Jordan and Lebanon, um, both at the university and high school levels. So each of these programs is focused on how students can work together on science and engineering projects that are addressing challenges to healthcare globally. Thanks, and we are happy to have you here today. Thank you panelists again for being here today. Your wealth of knowledge and experience will lead to an exchanging discussion today as we look forward to a year, a hopeful year ahead of virtual exchanges around the world. I cannot wait for you guys to share about your amazing programs. Now, I have some questions to help us create a better picture of how your organizations support virtual exchanges. Megan, what are the projects or activities that participants are working on and how are participants actively being engaged? Yeah, thank you. And it's a great question. So 
our students are working vir virtually in teams of four to five students. So each week they're gonna meet with a facilitator roughly three days per week for about an hour. And during that time, they'll go through like basic engineering activities on how to create a device or a solution um, to your problem basically from start to finish. Um, but in this process, they'll also be working on international teams to do that. So like I said, they're on teams of students with the US, uh, Lebanon and Jordan. Um, so they'll be going through lessons on how to communicate and collaborate internationally, and they'll go through activities where they discuss cultural and language differences, and then they'll go through activities discussing how those differences might affect um, different engineers and scientists who design products globally and how and what the different impl implications and things are for how that can affect global health as a whole. So we're really trying to engage students who are interested in science and math and continue to foster that. Um, but also get them thinking early about global context and the, the importance of understanding each other's cultures and context from outside your own community so that they can have that mindset moving forward when they are in the workspace and um, when they become engineers and scientists who start influencing change around the world. And yes, they surely will become a uh, future uh, engaged in our uh, as a STEM professional in the future because of your program. And I like how your program offers two tracks uh, for participants, one for high school and another one for undergraduates. And I really love the design project which addresses health challenges for low and middle income uh, communities. So great job. So now we will hear from Elizabeth. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, so during merge, um, participants spend about uh, the first five, actually six weeks, um, first exploring um, cultural differences and similarities um, and building the, the ground rules for um, a collaborative safe community uh, within the learning management system that the virtual exchange takes place in. They'll be introduced to their facilitators and then they're put into groups of 10 girls from the US and 10 girls from the MENA region that they'll be working with uh, throughout the duration of the rest of the exchange. Uh, each of the subsequent weeks, they will focus on one particular um, emotional or um, mental resilience strategy like meditation, um, or journaling um, or exercise. And they'll asynchronously get introduced to that at the be beginning of the week. Um, so basically asynchronously, meaning kind of on their own time, they're able to log in and access information um, at when is the best time for them. Uh, they'll journal about that, um, that activity throughout the week. Um, there will be a few different formats introduced and then they'll come back at the end of the week with their facilitator for a discussion. And ultimately this will lead up to um, the girl, girls in each section splitting off into mixed MENA region US uh, teams of five participants and deciding on one mental resilience strategy that was particularly effective for them as a group. And then coming up with a plan of how this could be um, messaged out to their communities um, and then also coming up with a community engagement component um, that will be featured in an interactive website in Arabic and English um, that we're hoping will be a, a longer standing resource um, than just for the duration of the two cohorts of this exchange. Wow, thanks for your insights. I agree that it's important to address uh, mental health with participants in a timely manner. Uh, so great job, uh, both of you, for the programs that you have shared with us so far. Thanks. So at this time, can someone describe your program from the perspective of a youth participant speaking to a teacher, parent, or other adults? Uh, Elizabeth? Sure, so I guess you can pretend that I am a 17 or, or 18 year old. And if I was talking to uh, an important adult in my life about um, what I learned or what I did during Merge, this is what I might say. So during Merge, I learned about mental health, focusing on my own emotional resilience and empowering my community. We spent our first week 
building a supportive global community through cultural exchange activities. The next five weeks, we, we explored practical approaches to strengthening emotional resilience. We're divided into 20 person sections, 10 from the US and 10 from the re MENA region to help each other implement these strategies in our own lives. Our facilitators guided us throughout, providing amazing resources and moderating discussions. We interacted in writing and via video, learning new apps like Nike Plus Training Club. Two live discussions about leadership and emotional re resilience took place, which I really got a lot, a lot out of. And in the project's final two weeks, my five-person team created an entry for Merge's Digital Resilience Strategies website. Wow. And if I was a parent or a caretaker, I would say, wow, I'm so excited about that program. Um, Megan, thanks for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you. So very similarly, if I were a student talking about this situation, I'd probably say that I was really excited because I got to work on an engineering project and learn about what it's like to work in hospitals around the world and some of the challenges that different areas face, especially in resource limited regions. So we've gotten to talk about all sorts of different areas of healthcare and the challenges, including medical equipment and sterilization and, and uh, even, even COVID and how different oxygen um, issues are related uh, and able to do this all while being on a team of students from the US, Lebanon and Jordan. And so learning about all of the differences between our countries um, while trying to solve problems and design new technologies and solutions together. So ultimately we're designing a prototype for a device or a solution. And at the end of the program, we're gonna be presenting it together on our solution and what we learned. That's amazing, that's amazing. I, I, I love this story. I can see uh, the kids going off or participants going off to be uh, STEM professionals, thanks. And Travis, we can't, we haven't heard from Travis. So Travis, could you please share a little bit about your program and what participants are working on and uh, share a story as well with us, what uh, participants may say to a family member or friend about your program? Sure, thank you, Melissa. Um, so our goal for the Coding with Empathy Challenge is to really empower middle school students to explore their local communities in order to learn about an, an issue that affects community members and then seek to understand and incorporate their community's perspectives as they take informed action. So we'll do that by matching peer classrooms in Egypt and the US and use Empatico's live video conferencing features alongside asynchronous communication tools like Flipgrid uh, to connect and share their learnings and feedback with each other across 12 weeks of the program. So at a high level, participants will learn about aspects of their own identities and consider and challenge who can be thought of as a computer science person based on certain identity stereotypes that they may have encountered. They'll learn about liberatory design thinking and ethics in STEM, and then finally take empathetic action to help others um, and tackle inequities in their communities and around the globe. All while learning coding basics through fun hands-on games and activities that we've partnered with code.org on developing. And then of course, developing empathy and compassion towards their new partner classmates. So from a, a participant's perspective, um, a couple of, ex of examples early on in the program when kids are first starting to explore their own identities and communities and then getting to know their partner class, they might say, oh, today I use this fun gamification tool um, called Kahoot to create a quiz uh, about our community filled with fun and interesting facts for our friends in Egypt to get to know our community better. Or later in the program towards the end, as the students are taking action in their communities, they might say, oh, we use this great um, tool on code.org called the App Lab to create a quiz app for to help community members learn about um, an issue that we really care about solving in our community. That's amazing, uh, Travis, and the work that uh, you guys are doing with Empatico. Uh, all these programs are amazing uh, with the mental health, uh, resilience, building that, and with working with uh, healthcare and engineering. And right now, with us going through challenging times, we know that coding is powering our world right now and that 
computer science is definitely one of the fastest growing professions. So thank you all for sharing. This has been great. So now I would like to share ways that participants can get involved with Stevens Initiative Partners. The initiative's drawn up program allows participants to have a great experience with virtual changes with guidance and support of educators or organizations. The Joiner program seeks educations or organization partners to implement an already established virtual exchange program that includes built-in resources into their classroom or program. The mobilized youth uh, participation pathway allows educators or organizations to share virtual exchanges opportunities with participants. Uh, participants, it is and open enrollment for them and young people can apply and participate on their own time. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to remind us which program your organization is a part of, then Megan and then Travis, thank you. Sure, so our program is actually part of both join a program and, mobile, and the mobilized youth participation pathway. And Melissa, did you want me to give a, just give you that information or give you a little bit more context about how we're involved in both of those um, programs. Yes, you can give us a brief overview. Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so for the uh, mobile youth participation pathway, our program is an open enrollment program. Um, and as long as participants um, meet the kind of participant profile of age, um, gender, and if, uh, English language ability, having teachers and educators and uh, people that work in the community help us recruit is a big part about how uh, students can get involved. And then for the um, the join a program pathway, um, we welcome classrooms or after school programs that have a focus on emotional resilience or on women women or girls empowerment and maybe a teacher who runs that to apply as a group. And while the teacher won't actively be administering um, part any part of the merge program. Um, they can be um, involved in the, I can send them additional information about the curriculum and about what girls are doing so that they can connect it to the activities that they're doing in their after school club or their, um, their class. And I'll pass it back to you. Happy to, and happy during the question time to answer any additional questions about that. Um, yes. I'll pass it back to you, Melissa. Thank you so much. Uh, Megan or Travis, would you like to go next? To, uh, Tell us what uh, program you are a part of and also how participants or organizations can join. Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, very similarly to what Elizabeth was saying through Mobilize Youth, one of the best ways to get yourself and your students involved is to encourage students to apply to the program because it is open enrollment. So we've got two uh, sessions running this summer, one throughout the month of July and one throughout the month of August. So each of our programs is four weeks long um, and, and just having your students fill out those applications and, and sign up is one of the best ways to get them directly involved right away. Um, and I'd love to continue talking to individual educators on how we can be more involved in your classes and your programming. So I really encourage you to reach out to me or to EWH um, directly if you have any specific questions or interests about our programs. Awesome, thank you. Tra Travis? Sure, um, so for our program, we're partnering with a number of school districts in the US, including DC Public Schools, um, Alhambra Elementary School District in Phoenix, and the NMSU. STEM Outreach Center in New Mexico, as well as Atija, um, who works on the ground in Alexandria and Cairo in Egypt. Um, and we'll be working with instructors in those communities for this program, but we also are part of the Join a Program Pathway, and so we're open to enrolling additional educators in the US and Egypt, and I encourage folks to reach out to, to us for those opportunities. Um, but I also would say in general for Empatico, we are a virtual exchange platform, so we're open to any primary school educator or instructor who works with kids ages six to 11. And any of those folks can go to empatico.org and sign up for free to match with the classroom uh, at any time outside of this specific program. Great, and I would like to mention, I am a user of Empatico 
And I have definitely been sharing the work uh, that Elizabeth and Marion organizations are doing. I'm excited about all three. All of you are who are focusing on my passion, what I love, STEM, building military health resilience. This is amazing, all three of your organizations. So thank you. The next question is directed to Travis and Elizabeth. If an educator plays a facilitator role, can you explain what they should expect? What type of resources do you provide them? And how should teachers facilitate students' learning? I know that's a mouthful, but uh, inquire minds want to know, so thank you. <laughs> Sure, and I think my answer is probably going to be shorter than Travis's because um, this is a more uh, supporting role than a direct classroom facilitation role. Um, and I think I touched on it a little bit, um, but if educators want to um, support participants in the Merch program, like I was mentioning before, if they run a program or after school program that's related to content that Merge focuses on for girls um, that are of the participant age group for Merge. Um, they can use the Merge framework and they can in their after school club or programming. Um, and they can also, when they have participants, they encourage their students or participants to apply. Uh, they can have participants list the school name and then on, that, um, on their application. And even though it's open enrollment, they can email me and say, hey, you know, I'm from Wilkins, Wilkins High School in you know, New Hampshire. Um, I have, you know, 20 students that are in this after school club applying, like, can you look, can you evaluate their applications as a whole, and then I can, that will allow me to group the applications in our in submittable, our application platform, look at all of them, and then if there's something that's missing or an issue with something, I can follow up with that teacher directly so they can get their, the, that student to go back in, um, edit their application, and resubmit before the deadline. And I also should have mentioned, um, I saw that Travis and Megan both did, that applications for Merge are currently open for Cohort 1, which starts on August 2nd. Um, and I dropped the link in the chat. And so I encourage any educators or um, people who work with youth that might be interested to share that far and wide. Um, and then we also will be running a second cohort um, with applications opening in November. And the program is free. I know I've, I, I think all of them are, but I, I know I've got, that's the most constant question that I've gotten um, from people thus far. Um, so just to put that out there, that with that, I will turn it over to Travis. That was actually not a very short answer. And, and educators, we do love free. Yes. <laughs> they make a wonderful program for us. But uh, Elizabeth, I just want to know, uh, does your program uh, give instructions to educators on how to uh, lead that in the classroom? So basically, I want to know, is it more student-led or more teacher-led? Definitely more student-led. I would, I'm happy to... We love the involvement of educators, and I think that that will just help the participants get more out of it and whatever community um, mental resilience building activity that they focus on for their final project, there'll be more probably a more likelihood that they'll have adult support to help implement that. Mm -hmm. um, with it. And so I'm happy to work with teachers on a one on one basis and provide them with um, some of the material that is shared in the merge curriculum or the framework for their curriculum that they want to parlay off of that in their after school or school programming. Great. And I'm glad to hear that you have a framework that helps give uh, teachers instructions on how to implement it where it's based off of more student autonomy than. Um, teacher autonomy and teacher leading because students learn more when they do the work. Definitely. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, but also give a teacher autonomy to do what they need to do in that classroom. Uh, Travis, so I'm gonna repeat the question for you again. Uh, if an educator plays a facilitator role, can you explain what they should expect? What type of resources do you provide for them? Uh, and how should teachers facilitate that learning? Yeah, so um, 
typically with Empatico, we're kind of a, a self-service technology platform where any educator can come to the platform and match with another classroom. And then we provide uh, the technologies and the resource guides to help uh, classrooms get their exchanges up and running, lesson plans, and ideas for conversation topics. And we're a little bit more hands-off. Um, but for this particular program, we will be providing more hands-on support for educators and facilitators, including an onboarding training session at the beginning of each cohort of the program, as well as more ongoing webinars on different topics in the program or how to facilitate certain projects. And then we'll also provide a full set of flexible activity plans and teacher resource guides on how to implement the full 12 weeks of the program, including um, how to use the different tools, uh, communication tools that we'll be using. Um, teachers will be facilitating most of the activities and virtual exchanges. Um, but can assign certain tasks to the middle school students. So for example, with this program, we'll be use, making use of the tool Flipgrid, which many of you may be familiar with, um, which can be done in the classroom with teacher guidance or teachers can assign certain uh, discussion topics for kids to do uh, in their own free time at home or elsewhere. Uh, amazing. Again, I cannot express enough how I feel that students should have autonomy over their own learning and the teacher should just be the facilitator, just helping um, them along the way. And that's when the magic truly happens. So thank you, Elizabeth and Travis. Uh, again, I cannot express how wonderful uh, your programs are for students uh, and well, participants. Okay, so this has been an insightful conversation about how your organizations are supporting virtual exchanges with participants around the globe. As we move to our last question, and I don't even want to stop, and I know we have other questions going in the chat box. This has been great. Please start sending questions to our Q&A box in our, um, so we can continue the conversation. And now I have a question for Elizabeth. What is the primary impact of your program on participants learning in or out of a classroom? Just needed to find my unmute button there. Um, so that is a really fantastic question. And so I think on a, a really high level, the, the whole point of merge is that participants will feel empowered to uh, I, identify and utilize a range of stress relief and coping and healthy coping techniques like journaling, exercise, meditation, positive thoughts and affirmations, um, using nutrition to support um, mental health um, and whatnot. And then also be able to be empowered to explain the science of why that works. So understand not just how it works and what works for them, but the, the why behind it. Um, and then I also think that we are trying to help create a, an environment and a virtual community that empowers these young women to be advocates for not just their own emotional resilience and mental health, but emotional resilience strategies and healthy mental health strategies in their communities as well. Um, and I think that during the, the idea for this project actually came out of another virtual exchange that Global Ties ran last year that was supposed to be a blend, a partially virtual, partially in-person virtual exchange between Pakistani and U.S. high school students. And we had to completely pivot it because of COVID. And we found that students were in Google Classroom forums sharing coping skills and um, things that they were doing that was were helping them feel um, less sad, really, and, and more able to deal with the changes that were happening. And um, we looked at that and said, wow, what, what if there was a virtual exchange that was really focused on, specifically focused on building those um, emotional resilience and mental health skills, and that's how the, the seed for the idea of Merge um, was born. And so we're super excited to have this opportunity to um, hopefully empower the young women that participate in our, in our project to be mental health advocates um, in their own lives and their own communities. 
I, that is amazing. And we do need more girls that grow up into women and advocate uh, for mental health. And we really understand how we had to be flexible uh, during this pandemic. So that's awesome. Uh, Megan, um, again, the question is, what is the primary impact of your program on participants learning in or out of the classroom? Definitely. Um, and I want to say, as I learn more about Travis and Elizabeth's projects, it's all, all really inspiring and, and encouraging to, to keep on with these projects. Um, I think one of the most exciting parts of our program is that it's incredibly interdisciplinary meaning it's got appeal for students who are mostly interested in science and math. And it's also got huge aspects for students who are more interested in international exchange and the humanities. So it really works to combine these lessons from different disciplines that are sort of traditionally seen as quite separate, but they have huge benefits when discussed together. So for a student who's like really interested in science and math focus um, and his traditional education might not include a lot of conversation about other cultures and communication and collaboration, they're going to be getting that in this program. And for a student who's really interested in history or writing or, or politics and really wants that international engagement, um, they're definitely going to be getting that. And they're also going to be exploring problem solving methods and design thinking and how they can apply that to international challenges or challenges that they're able to identify within their com own communities. Thank you for looking at all the different uh, modalities to accommodate our learners. It's amazing. Um, Travis, would you like to share with us about your uh, program primary impact as well? Yes. Um, so for us, given our name of Empatico, we care a lot about empathy and connection and social emotional learning. Um, I think particularly after the isolation of the last year, we've talked a lot about the need for connection and to focus on kids and educators' emotional well-being and as Elizabeth has talked about, uh, resilience and mental health. Um, in general, we really want to provide experiences that help kids reconnect with each other and process what they've been through, um, but also have fun with their peers uh, locally and globally in the next year. So for this program specifically, we want to help kids understand how they all have a role in STEM and demystify for them who can play a role in computer science regardless of their background or identity. And with that, we think a lot about the long-term impact of making STEM fields more inclusive and equitable so that our technologies and solutions can better challenge and disrupt inequities in the world. Um, from a teacher perspective, we're really designing this curriculum so that it ticks a lot of content boxes, similar to what Megan shared. It's very interdisciplinary uh, from STEM to social studies to social emotional learning so that we hope it can easily, more easily fit into what teachers are already doing in the classroom. That's amazing. And what I can say from all three programs and yours as well is what you say, exposure is key. It is very important to expose our learners to different things so that they can make better uh, decisions. So again, thank you all three. And of course, empathy is definitely important. <laughs> I talk a lot about that with my kids, uh, understanding others so that you can help make informed decisions. And so I have a few more questions for you just so we can remind everyone just Again, you're great, and, and just so they can get more context about your programs. Um, can you remind us of the age levels of your programs, uh, starting with you, Elizabeth, and then Megan and Travis? Sure. So our program, our merge participants should be between 15 to 19 years old as of the start date of the program. Um, so if there are any, if there's anyone in the higher education universe that is listening in, um, even though that this topic is not titled that, um, we do, even though I have been saying high school participants, high school young women, high school teachers, we do accept um, participants that may be in their you know, first or second year of university or community college, um, so up to, up to 19. Um, and yeah. I will turn it back over to Melissa. Okay. Uh, Megan, would you like to uh, tell everyone what age is 
level did your program focus on? Yeah, so um, we have both high school and college level programs. For our high school students, um, it's roughly 14 to 18 years old, um, sort of that ninth grade through 12th grade level. Um, and if there are students who have like recently graduated high school or, or maybe above 18, um, they are potentially eligible for one of our future college programs and we can fit them in there. And then um, our college programs are all at the adult level if you're, if you're in undergraduate or potentially even graduate school. Uh, that's amazing that you focus on undergrad as well, because we do know that co co college is the gateway to the profession, right? So thank you. Uh, Travis? So for this particular program, the Coding with Empathy Challenge, it's open for middle school educators, so roughly students ages 11 to 14. Um, but in general, for folks who are interested in trying out Empatico, we typically offer it for primary school educators, so kids ages 6 to 11. So stay tuned for potential expansion of that age range um, once ahead. Awesome. And um, are these curriculums matched with schools' uh, science standards or reading, looking at the different content areas? So, you know, often uh, teachers or even uh, principals may ask, the work that you are doing, is it aligned to the standards? Uh, Travis? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a really, we're trying to be very interdisciplinary with the program. And so um, we are aligning it to definitely the CASEL core competencies for social emotional learning, um, as well as to social studies standards, and then a little bit in science and, and STEM in general. I think the, the focus of the program is a little bit more around kind of engineering and computer science, and we'll be working with a number of classrooms that are specifically doing coding content and aligning it to their um, coding curriculum. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Megan? Yeah, so our content um, isn't specifically catered to match lessons uh, it, that are specific to county or statewide education, but we are really interested in speaking with teachers to continue adapting our curriculum and figuring out how we can make it better fit what you're doing in your classrooms at that time. So it's definitely a conversation that we're willing to continue having. Yes, that's amazing. But I like the way that your program is open for a teacher to have autonomy to introduce uh, participants to STEM at a great age. So um, awesome. So if you need a teacher, I'm here and I can find you some. <laughs> we would love to talk about it. You have a great program. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth. So our um... So merge is not currently matched with, I guess it would probably be any socio-emotional um, learning framework for the upper grades. Um, we're, we're focusing first on um, working with uh, mental health, our, our subject matter experts, mental health experts, and making sure that the material that we're sharing and the way that we're sharing it in our facilitator training is um, science-based and of the most current um, best practices within the mental health field. Um, but I think a next step after that, all, all those boxes are checked, maybe for the cohort that's uh, gonna be running in the, win in the winter of uh, 2021, 2022, would be matching if there was a teacher that was particularly passionate about emotional resilience and mental health um, for teenagers and wanted to connect and help match it to a social emotional learning framework. Um, I would definitely, as a former teacher myself, uh, completely understand where this question is coming from. I would love to embark on that so it can be more uh, closely aligned to what's being covered in schools. Yes, and, and what your program is doing is amazing. I think uh, uh, what the pandemic has showed us that we have to think about social emotional learning and your mm -hmm. program does a great job in doing that. And I know that educators are now thinking about ways to reel in that piece of being resilient and getting kids to have a conversation about how they're feeling. So 
a teacher would jump on <laughs> the opportunity, uh, Elizabeth. So thank you. So wrapping up, there is one final question. We are asking for rapid fire responses and anybody can go at any time. What is something unexpected you think young people will get out of your program? I guess I can jump in. I think it may not be something given the, the focus of the program entirely unexpected, but I think that there may be way more peer to peer learning um, of tactics and strategies that are shared that maybe aren't directly covered uh, within the curriculum that we're developing for Merge. Um, more peer to peer learning than participants may, and even facilitators and probably even me, um, may be expecting going in um, because our, our young people, especially young people that choose to uh, expand their horizons and their universe by participating in programs like this, have so much to share themselves. And so I think that they may come out um, with strategies that uh, are generated amongst the great discussions that I know they're going to have and maybe not even something that we planned. So I'm excited to see that. I can go. Um, you know, our, our program, we expect there to be a lot of rich discussion around equity inclusion in STEM fields. But as I mentioned before, too, we really want this to be a fun experience for kids after the last year. And so um, I mentioned to you, we're partnering with code.org on this program. And one of the activities that we'll be incorporating from their Hour of Code initiative is the code.org dance party. Um, which is a fun session that teaches coding skills, but also gets kids up and moving. Um, and we'll definitely expose kids to some of the cultural differences that we talked about before. Um, but and we often see a lot of similarities, surprising similarities in dance moves across regions and countries um, during Empatico virtual exchanges. So I think um, a little bit of fun and physical activity will be a, an unexpected benefit. Yes, and kids, participants love to dance and they definitely understand. That's a universal language, right? <laughs> Great. Uh, Megan? <laughs> yeah, that's that's so wholesome, Travis. I love that. Um, so I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll have students finding themselves interested in fields that they may not have otherwise been exposed to or, or been thinking about. Um, so students who don't have a ton of engineering exposure, this will probably be their first like design experience. And I'm hoping to inspire some passion there. And for students who will maybe are already following that path, I'm hoping that they might find a new passion for like travel and international exchange and collaboration. And part of what we're doing is, is really trying to foster um, conversations around all of those things and conversations that might be even tough or challenging. And I, and I think students might be surprised by that. And I'm hoping that they'll they're able to gain strategies for continuing that kind of discussion and and everything further and uh, continue with that along in their lives. And you know, hopefully maybe one day some of these students will have the opportunity to visit the places that they're collaborating with in this program. Wow, thank you, Megan, thank you. So thank you, you all and see a hope for the future in virtual exchanges around the globe. I'm truly inspired by all three of your programs. And I wish <laughs> your programs were around when I was in school because I would be signing up all three. <laughs> so, um, so now we will go live for a brief Q&A session to answer any questions um, you may have. And so I have a few in the chat box. So, how do you recruit schools to participate? I can jump in on, on this one. So as I mentioned in my introduction about what Global Ties US is, that we have a network of community-based members. And so on the US side, we've been doing our recruitment through five um, pre-selected community-based members uh, that have deep to educational institutions in their community, and then also some just 
general outreach to organizations like Girls Incorporated that focus on the topic matters that we uh, that Merge is exploring. Um, and then on the MENA region side, um, we have two in-country partner organizations, um, one in Morocco and the other in Jordan. Um, that have also strong connections to their um, local schools um, and are doing are handling a lot of the recruitment on that side. Um, and then we are also connected with the uh, with the I always forget what the acronym stands for, but UNRWA. Um, it's the UN organization um, that works in the Palestinian territories. Um, and so they are also recruiting um, from the schools that that they and the girls that come to the schools that they have going right now. Um, so that's, that's but we're, as I said, it's an open enrollment program. So we're always looking for new schools, uh, more participants um, and applications are open. So please apply, please encourage you to apply that you might be interested. Yes, and when is the, uh, when is the open enrollment in deadline? If you wanna get is, that in oh, Yes, July 12th. So 11.59 p.m. on July 12th, we just, we were initially going to close the end of this month, um, but there were a bunch of questions, and so but some folks needed a little bit more time, so we um, we extended it to July 12th. Okay. Don't miss out, July the 12th. <laughs> uh, uh, Travis? Sure. Um, I guess it's, we build relationships with schools through a number of different ways um, some of it is teachers and schools or districts reaching out directly to us asking how to get involved some of it is more proactive outreach um, on our part i think often it's through working with amazing educators like melissa who've used empatico in their classrooms and want to help bring it to others in their school or district and we formed a lot of relationships with schools and districts that way um, I think that's true of many of the partners that we'll be working with uh, on this particular uh, coding initiative as well. Awesome, thank you. Megan, would you like to add something? Yeah, so um, very similar to the previous two answers. Um, in, in the MENA region, we're working specifically with um, certain schools and districts to recruit students from both Jordan and Lebanon. Um, and in the US, we are, it is, it is open enrollment to pretty much all students. And we're working a lot with like specific teachers and specific um, schools to, to recruit their students. We do uh, really want to emphasize students who may not have traditionally gotten access to international exchange programs or to um, like STEM extracurriculars and things like that. So we do have a strong emphasis for um, Title I schools and and different charter schools and things like that and, and really engaging their students. Um, so if you are coming from uh, a school with a, a student body that is, is traditionally not represented in STEM or in um, international exchange, we definitely want to hear from you and get your students involved. Um, and it's, it's open enrollment. So we are accepting students from, from pretty much everywhere. Great. Thank you uh, all. So there are so many great questions uh, in the chat box. And uh, here's another wonderful question. If they do students receive anything at the end of programming? So Megan, you can answer and then Travis and Elizabeth. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Okay, I'm sorry. They, um, said do students receive anything at the end of the programs yeah so our students do all receive mm -hmm. our students do all receive a like certificate of completion that they can either put on college applications or that they can put on a resume or anything along those lines i also have had tons of students reach out to me for recommendation letters and, and everything along those lines um, and in addition they get added to like the stevens alumni list um, as well as our own alumni list so they'll receive all sorts of emails and information about opportunities moving forward and um, whether those are opportunities for like more exchanges or whether it's it's other opportunities and, and things that they can get involved with or other projects um, that is something that they'll they'll be engaged in moving forward so that they're able to stay connected with their teammates and and our organization and sort of everyone who's been involved with this overall project uh, that's amazing and i like um megan too how your uh, program allow past participants 
to uh, apply to be a facilitator. So giving them that leadership role. So that's amazing as well. Thank you. Yes, exactly. And we have had students, we've, we've got students from our previous programs already running those programs that are about to be starting, so. Yes, that's awesome. Uh, Elizabeth or Travis. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I can go quickly. It's a great question. We haven't thought um, a ton about this necessarily. We usually provide a certificate for educators after they complete uh, an Empatico virtual exchange. So we'll likely do something similar um, and probably provide educators with a template that they can use um, to distribute to students at the end of the program. Amazing, amazing. And, and I can say this, Travis, the kids, their reward has been just to talk to a different culture. They're so excited to get involved. <laughs> so that's like a huge prize for the kids, uh, more valuable than a tangible item. So thank you both, Megan and Travis. Okay, Elizabeth. Sure. And so a lot of the things that Megan mentioned are similar to what Merge alumni will be eligible for. Um, so they'll get a certificate of completion in leadership and mental health awareness. Um, they will, and I believe this is for all Stevens alumni, um, but they'll get access to the US Department of State's International Exchange Alumni Network, which has a bunch of opportunities. Um, they will they'll be included in, um, spe in special opportunities for Global Ties US um, virtual exchange alumni programming that as we have as we're completing more virtual exchanges that's something that we're um, beginning to look at building out and i would love to replicate what megan was saying um, of using prior program participants um, or inviting them to apply as facilitators um, i think that's really powerful so it's super cool to hear that megan um, and then also the being part of the stevens alumni um, network and being eligible for the stevens initiative alumni small grants program is another pretty cool opportunity, especially with some of these, for any of these programs is come with finishing the program with a tangible project or product um, and maybe having the opportunity through the, uh, the Stevens Initiatives Alumni Small Grants Program to actually fund the implementation of that project. And I know Elizabeth and Megan, both of your programs allow students to demonstrate what they learned so that they can, uh, share with their communities and that is very uh, important and valuable. So, yes, and so I see so many teachers are getting motivated in organizations. I wanna read one right now. He says, I'm a high school teacher and I'm interested in working in an exchange program with partners from the US. So you have definitely motivated some people today. And so come to my last question. Uh, can the US schools choose school partners in Pacific international cities? I can just jump in because I have an easy answer that unfortunately the way that our program is set up now, no, that's not, we, we could certainly um, inform the organization of participants from their city that they may have encouraged to apply. Um, but the way that we are intentionally mixing um, folks from across the U.S. and across the MENA region in these same small little participant groups with their facilitator, um, that, that wouldn't be possible with the way the program's set up. Thank you. Uh, Travis, what about Empatico? Can you place uh, U.S. educators with uh, someone they would like to be partnered with? So for this particular program, it's a similar answer to Elizabeth. Uh, um, short answer, no. Um, it is just the US to Egypt connections. Um, but in general on Empatico, when an educator signs up, they fill in some basic information, like the age of the students, where you're located, what times during the week you're available for a live video connection. Um, and then we use that to give educators basically a list of everyone that they could match with who's at least 300 miles or 480 something kilometers away um, and they can request to match with those classrooms. So it gives you some flexibility to choose um, the location of who you'd like to match with. 
Yes, thank you. And I can tell you from experience with virtual exchanges, once you start, you will not want to stop. It's like a dip. <laughs> so um, it is 12 o'clock. I do not want to end this conversation. And I want to tell everyone that can hear the sound of my voice, it is so much that you can learn about these great programs. Uh, they can't tell you everything. They're just doing so many amazing things. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. We hope that you are leaving with a great understanding of how to engage in virtual exchanges around the globe. If you are interested, please fill out the join the program and or the mobilized youth participation form on the engage section of the website. And you heard it from the uh, panelists. You can visit their uh, websites and join their programs as well. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Travis, Elizabeth. Thanks, and everyone. Thanks, Melissa. You're a fabulous moderator. I love the energy that you brought. It made I it like woke me up, even though it's afternoon. Uh, so thank you for bringing your energy and positive spirit to this. Thank you. You guys woke me up. Look, I I I can't let go of, of this sheet. Learn about all you guys. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Thank you. I need you guys to start at the elementary level. <laughs> All right, bye everyone. Bye-bye.